All right, it should be live. All right, well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for Sunday, July 28th, 2013, in the middle of the summer, the long nights, the late start for the folks on the East Coast. I deeply apologize. Don't worry. Uh, when we move around to the winter time, we'll be starting at 5 o'clock our time, 8 o'clock your time. It'll be perfect. Prime time while the rest of us will, won't even have eaten dinner yet. So um, it'll be good. So joining me tonight, we've got uh, two astronomers, maybe a third, uh, and uh, we've got uh, some other people along for color commentary. So joining me from Los Angeles, we've got, uh, we've got Gary Ganella. Hey, Gary. Oh, everybody. And you got nice clear skies, Gary? Yep, yep, looking good. Good, all right. And we've got uh, Louis Momekos from... Central Pennsylvania, so he's over on the uh, on the East Coast. So this is great. We're splitting the difference. We've got we've got Gary on the West Coast, we've got Lewis on the East Coast, and uh, and your your skies are looking nice and clear as well. Yeah. Good evening, Fraser. They sure are for a change. It's good. Been, yeah. It's been a been many many weeks. Yeah. That's gotta that's gotta be rough for you. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, for color commentary is uh, Stuart Foreman and. Hi. And Stuart, last week we were we were sort of set to go, and then Stuart yeah. was the only one who actually had clear skies last week, and so unfortunately this week the fog rolled in, and he's yeah. not, totally not, out of not, luck. Not so clear. And uh, and uh, Doctor Thad Zabo is trying to join us. He's uh, he's having some problems with his internet connection, but we might get a view from his telescope as well. So uh, so we'll see if that we'll see if that all works. So just two telescopes tonight, but mm. both have been both astronomers have been instructed to go as quickly as humanly possible. And so hopefully, I think we're going to get through a ton of objects. We're just going to be efficient. This is going to be like a strike team. We're not messing around. There's not going to be any of this blah, 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 color commentary. <laughs> we're just going to bang, just you know, hammer out all these objects. But, but before we sort of, as a sort of a treat, at the very beginning, uh, Lewis, you brought us something really special tonight. I did. Uh, well, I guess it's special. Um... I have uh, Pluto, which used to be a planet that before being disrespected than just a planetoid or asteroid or some other kind of object. Um, this is a 60-second uh, long image. Pluto isn't very interesting to look at in uh, a small telescope like mine. You can't resolve a disk or anything, but but here it is, indicated by the uh, the two red marks on the display. Let me let me sort of zoom in in the star field. Uh, believe it or not, that's Pluto. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. <laughs> Well, if you took another picture, it would have moved a tiny little bit, right? Yeah, that's right. If we were to come back, uh, probably you know, in a couple of days, you should be able to see that move to a different spot. So, Lewis, how do you know that's Pluto? I went to my handy dandy planetarium program and uh, asked it where Pluto should be tonight, and uh, and the coordinates that it came up with actually match uh, where it appeared in my image. So. It must be Pluto. In that you could see all those other stars in the field where the where the astronomy software was telling you. Yeah, that's right. And um, my astronomy software has this capability to plate solve the image, meaning that uh, I can take an image and it can match the stars up with the database that it has. Um, and so I can sort of calibrate the coordinates of the image and I can drive my cursor across the image and it will tell me exactly what celestial coordinates are right under my cursor, and when I moved my cursor to where Pluto was, uh, sure enough, it appeared right there. Well, what constellation is Pluto in right now, if people want to go outside and look up and try and find it? Um, it's, in, it's in Sagittarius. I'm looking at it right now, and uh, it's actually right, and the reason why there's so many stars around it, it's right um, uh, on the Milky Way disk. Uh, so it's uh, if you look towards Sagittarius, right towards the Milky Way disk, you'll be looking right at Pluto, even though you won't be knowing you'll be looking right at Pluto. Yeah, I pulled back uh, in the image, and yeah, it's embedded in a pretty dense star field. Yeah, uh, which made it a little bit of a challenge tracking it down. But hmm. yeah, I think people, you know, your your telescope is a quite a sort of narrow field of view, and so you know, you're not looking at a very big chunk of the sky here. But I, I guess you know because we're looking into Sagittarius, this is the this is towards the core of the galaxy. You're going to see a lot, you know, it's a lot denser in terms of stars, just because this is we're, we're looking towards the center of the galaxy as opposed to, you know, up or down or out away from the galaxy. 
Yeah, and this is an area, this is less than a square degree, so I guess that's um, yeah, bigger than a full moon, uh, but still a relatively small part of the sky. Yeah, you could just fit you know, the full moon with a little room to spare on the top, bottom, left, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, that's great. That's our first Pluto viewing of the season, and I know Mike Phillips is going to be really frustrated because it's typically his job to bring us Pluto and... <laughs> and uh, Uranus and Neptune each. Uh, and, and he did it last year, and we, you know, we must have spent the whole virtual star party. Like, are we sure? Is that it? Is that? It? Are we sure? And this, you're just like, yeah, there it is. There's Pluto. Let's move on. Okay, all right. That's uh, this is this is how far we've come in a year. So, <laughs> um, perfect. Ho hum. Ho hum. There's Pluto. <laughs> By the way, there's Pluto. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, live for you in a uh, in a, you know in a Google uh, Google Plus Hangout on air. Everybody step outside and wave to Pluto. <laughs> the, the Pluto's not, New Horizons isn't taking a picture this week. So, All right, well, I'm going to move back over to, uh, to Gary's view. This and... is the Trifid Nebula. Right on. And, uh, in color, it's nice because since I'm shooting in hydrogen alpha, I get all this hydrogen red area here. There's also a lot of blue, which is going to be um, some oxygen glowing, which I can't see. But I did take this at uh, no binning, so it's one-to-one. -one. So here's uh, some of the zooming in. And you can see the dark dust lanes and all the neat little fiddly bits going on in there. <laughs> little fiddly bits. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the Trifid Nebula, a.k.a. M20, and this is a star-forming region in Sagittarius. M so it's M20. M20. This is it? M20, yes. Okay, then I got it wrong. Um, only off by one. He only off yeah. by one, you know. Uh, but this is in Sagittarius, so this is this part. This is, you know, we're looking towards the the core of the galaxy, and the place is crazy with nebula and you know, clusters and things like that, because it's just... A and and it's not too far away from Pluto right now, actually. And it's, oh, like the Triffid is really close to Pluto, yeah. It is, right. And um, it's about the size of a full moon, so um, you can actually take your binoculars, and if you know where you're looking, you can probably see a small fuzz where the Triffid is. And there's Thad. Green Dr. Thad Zabo. Good evening. Where are you? Are you outside? I'm, I'm in my backyard. So I have a telescope set up here, um, but uh, still haven't worked out some of the, the camera issues and whatnot yet. So, so you're not quite ready to go live. Yeah. Are we? Okay. Well, we are on air right now. We are on air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if you, if you give me 15 minutes here... I, well, I don't know whether I don't know whether we want your brain or whether we want your telescope at this point. I'd like both. You could just you know seamlessly go back and forth, sharing your uh, your knowledge and your uh, and the view from your telescope. Uh, can we? But you missed something. So let's, can we just go back, Lewis? Can you bring up the previous picture because Thad just missed it? And I thought he'd like to see it. Uh sure. Give me just a second. All right. Sure. We'll just go back for one second. Uh. It's a tiny, icy object in in Sagittarius. So yep. if people want, uh, you can always give us any questions, comment, feedback. If you want to make some requests, we're glad to to take any requests. If you know your night sky, you know what objects you'd like to see. Um, so if you uh, you can do that either on uh, Google Plus if you're watching this on the event page, if you're watching this on you know my stream, or if you're watching this on uh, on YouTube. You can make a comment there. YouTube's sort of the safest place, so somebody's got an open. I'm getting some echo from somebody. Stuart, maybe. Hmm. Uh, so I, anyway, I, I'm muted. So okay. So Thad, do you know what this is? We got Pluto. You got Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we oh, have very Pluto. Very nice. Yeah. It's so there's very our nice. there's our first Pluto of the season. So yeah, I mean it's well placed right now, um, especially because I mean Lewis is on the east coast, right? So that's right. It's you know going to be what just past its uh, just past its highest point in the sky right about now for for you over there. So, and although from PA, right, you're in you're in Pennsylvania. Yeah, so that's does, right. It never gets that high off the, the horizon from there though, because yeah, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania and I remember like not being able to see Halley's Comet mm -hmm. because it was right over Allentown when I was growing up. So. Yeah, we don't get much of a view of Sagittarius from here. We, it, you know, pokes up above the tree line, and then heads back down. We don't get much of it. 
you got to be in the height of summer to be able to make it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but wow, good capture. Yeah, yeah, it's Thanks. amazing. All right, well, I, and then I'll go back to Gary's view now, and then we can come back to, to yours in a second. So, um, Gary. This is our perennial favorite, M16 yeah. Eagle. And I uh, also did this with no uh, no binning, so we can zoom in and see all the uh, pillars of creation and all that fun stuff going on in there. And so can you embiggen it? I can embiggen it a little bit more. There we go. And there's the pillars right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. real nice. How long of an exposure was this? Uh, one minute at uh, no binning. One minute, no binning. So. so I got pretty clear skies. Yeah. Yeah, same here. So, seeing yeah. as we're we're only about you know about what sixty miles apart maybe so if that yeah something like yeah. that so but one thing was yeah I was thinking you know well maybe maybe I could bring Saturn um, and then I realized it's right in the flight path of Long Beach Airport from where I am <laughs> and so we'd be able to see Saturn and yep plane just went right over it right now so you know that probably wouldn't have been uh, you know you'd be able to read the the, the you know, call number off the the airplane or something, but yeah, I don't know about uh, trying to bring Saturn from here. So. Oh, that would be great though. It'd, it'd be great <laughs> if we could get it. We, we one time, didn't we? Was Mark or Corey had a had an airplane fly right through their shot of the moon? So we've had that happen before. That's yeah. That that would be happening on a regular basis from where Saturn is and from where my scope is set up right now. Well, now I want to see this. Yeah, I uh, give me. Like I said, give me ten minutes. Well, uh, I, I, I can, I can. I've got my uh, cheat sheet here, so I can do your. I can, I can play Thad for fifteen minutes while you're <laughs> messing with it. Yeah. Um, uh, so Jose Barrero asks for NGC seven zero zero eight. Anybody know where that is? So seven thousand is the North America Nebula. So seven thousand eight. Is that the Pelican? I don't know. I imagine it's kind of the up. Fe- the fetus neb, the fe- the fetus nebula. Oh, fetus. Fetus. P h a e t u s. It's f e t u s. F e t. Yeah. So fetus nebula. Okay. No, I haven't heard of that one. So. No. Um. There's there's no way that Gary is going to be able to get it. Um, Lewis might be. It's only 1.6 by 1.2 arc minutes. Um. Yeah, uh, it's really it, tiny. It's yeah, in it's a constellation Cygnus. Yeah, it's a planetary nebula. Yeah. Yeah, that that's probably not going to uh, show up really good at my image scale, and the, and the seeing is not really that great here tonight either. I have NGC seventy three thirty one from uh, about twenty minutes All right, ago. Let's, let's talk about this now. then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is the uh, the cocoon nebula. Oh no! You have the cocoon nebula. Can we can we take a quick look at that? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me put that yeah. back. Um, Shame to waste a nice image that you had there. There we go. The cocoon nebula. Uh, this is a one minute um, one minute exposure as well. It's a little noisy. Um, I, I've done some other uh, work with this object um, in uh, in breathtaking full color, including hydrogen alpha. And it's a beautiful object. Um, what I find interesting about this object, uh, it's also embedded in the, I think, in the Milky Way, so it's in a very dense star field. It's an emission nebula, meaning that this part, if it was color, would would be glowing in a, uh, in a hydrogen alpha red-ish color. Right. Um, so emission nebula here, and off to the side, I'm not sure, yeah, my cursor's showing up. Off to the side here um, is a reflection nebula, so it kind of glows blue, illuminated by a nearby star. And then the other neat thing is uh, you can see sort of diagonally across the image, uh, it's not that there are fewer stars here, it's just that they're obscured by dust and gas, which I presume is associated with the, uh, with the nebula as well. Yeah, so it's, it's another one of these complexes where you have dark nebula, emission nebula from hydrogen gas, and, and reflection nebula. So the, the trifid is similar to that, although not quite as much dark nebula, way more emission, and then it, that, that beautiful kind of blue reflection nebula that the whole thing is immersed in. But this is one that's you know much better placed for people at, at higher latitudes. This, uh, this pass is very near the zenith for for people at, uh, at higher latitudes. And if I remember correctly, Corey Schmitz is trying to do a large scale kind of mosaic of, of not just the co- cocoon, but uh, a large portion of the sky surrounding it as well. So, He's just the man for the job. 
that could be something you know we have to look forward to by the uh, the end of the summer here. No pressure, well, Corey. No pressure, you're... Corey. Yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, it really does look like a almost like a comet, like a dark comet, like it's got a dark tail behind it. So yeah, again, it being in the thick of the Milky Way like that, you can you can definitely have the uh, it, it provides contrast for where the dark nebula is. I mean, you can have a dark nebula in another region of the sky, and you'd really never know it's there because there's no stars behind it um, be coming through. And I'm hearing echo on myself, too. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to try muting Gary first. So are we still getting echo? I don't know. Am I? I think, I think it's Gary, yeah. I think uh -oh. we, we killed the echo. Sorry, Gary. Oh, well, wait. I, no, that's me. I, I just unmuted myself. This is an experiment. I don't know why I'm echoing. <laughs> so I'll just... The I'll sound's just, probably yeah. just coming from your. You see, if you can turn down the audio on your headphones, it's coming from your headphones and back out your mic, your microphone. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll mute that down. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, <laughs> Jose says uh, you can definitely bring in the NGC seven zero zero eight. It's bright. He's begging you, Lewis. Begging you. All right. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> that, that was seven zero zero eight. Yeah, and yeah, we've well, never seen it. So you know, if anybody I, can do it, you can. You've yeah. got the. You've got the. <laughs> the, the you got the scope for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that'll be great. Uh, and Terry I mean, Rhodes confirms that the Stellarium showed Pluto just like the picture. So. You yeah, know, the the position of all the stars that we had there was Pluto. I mean, just to give you an, its idea of image scale, the what the. Excuse me. What the person is asking for is about a fifth the size of the Ring Nebula. I mean, it is tiny. That that doesn't sound too hopeful. Last night I might have been able to shoot something like that. I was shooting at uh, f10 last night, and I've got a shot. Of, uh, I have okay. a Ring Nebula I can put up. I I took uh, after live. Ring. Yeah, we're losing you, Dad. Oh, sorry. Um, so, yeah, this was a shot of M13 that I got last night, and I was shooting at F10. At that focal length, then, I'm, you know, I might have a shot at something along those lines. But let me just bring up this this image. You know, it's kind of breaking the rules. But, hey, it's, it's fresh from last night. Is that, it's fine. Know? It's fine. I've, I've, <laughs> I've relaxed the rules now. I'm not so hard about it anymore. So this was um, no, this was from my backyard, which is in Long Beach. And this is this is a whited out area. I mean, you know, if I, right now I have the glow of the computer monitor on me, which is, is making it kind of uh, even more difficult to see some stuff. Um, but even if I didn't have any lights back here, I wouldn't even be able to see the Keystone in Hercules, which is where this is located. Um, but let me let me just share this out here. Hey, we got NGC seven three three one there. Okay, but. Well, I'm gonna move to I'm gonna move to uh, to Gary's view here. Oh, here we oh. go. Okay, great. Let's let's that, look at your let's look at your photo. Of that that, that was that, that was my shot of M13 from from last night, and this is a highly light polluted area. Wow. So just a, what what how much how much total image capture was that? Let's see. So it was 34 20 second exposures. So 34 individual 20 individual 20 second exposures at f10. And see, it gets a little noisy around the the edges. Um, but this was with uh, stacked in nebulosity and processed in Pix Insight. And, Came uh, out real nice. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, this um, it was kind of lucky imaging, just playing around, like, what can I do for my backyard? Do I still have to drive two hours to be able to shoot deep sky objects? And uh, Depends on the object. Depends on the object. Something very bright like this, you know, I can do from here. If, uh, you know, something like the North American Nebula, no way. Right, there's no way I'd ever get that from here. Um, you know, well, I should I shouldn't say no way. I should try. You know, maybe I should try some stuff with filters first. But this was non-filtered. Mm -hmm. No light pollution filter. No other filters applied. What was your um, camera? Uh, an ATIC 314L Plus uh, color CCD camera. So it didn't. So it does RGB just in one shot. That would be nice live, even. That would be great. I'd like to see that bad boy in the star party. You know, you like I said, if you can give me a. Uh, Stuart, if you want to can cover me for me ten minutes, I can. I, I got, I got, I got your back. Yeah, yeah, we, we got your back. We can, I, we can do it. I can do it. I can serviceably also talk about space stuff. Stuff. <laughs> All right, let me let me leave that up here in the meantime, then, while I go work on this. Sure. So. We we'll just keep going back to it and 
and uh, gazing at it. Okay. Uh, someone wants to know what size telescope Thad has. He's got a 9.5 inch telescope, if I recall correctly. Um, someone's asking for NGC 6823. So anyway, um, Gary, what is this? This is the Swan. Um, nice. M17. And again, that one's taken at full res, so I can zoom in and see all the neat little things going on in here. Yeah, I love all these sort of little complexes, these these lanes of dust and gas. And then also you can really see that bright area there where the just the there's a bunch of you know really young hot stars that are putting out so much radiation, they're just blowing out the exposure. We get that same problem with the Orion Nebula too. This this nebula has a bunch of different names: um, the Omega, the Swan, the Horseshoe, Lobster, M17, um, and this is a very bright nebula in the in the southern skies. It's a lot of fun to image, um, and it's it's really nice in color too. It's nice and bright uh, bright red, uh, bright red emission nebula. So can you zoom out again, Gary? I want to see if we can see the lobster. Because I think we've we've seen that. Yeah, I don't remember how we saw it now. Yeah, I don't remember either. Maybe just the body, and and the and feet and stuff and the tail here. You got to remember that as well that you, <laughs> it could always be flipped, right? But I'm seeing like antenna on the top there. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> I always love. Oh, you flipped it. Okay, all right. Yeah. I'm not seeing anything any better flipping it though. No. But it's a fun one. Oh, uh, that's funny. Cool. Okay, great. I'm gonna go back to Lewis' view now. Lewis, NGC seven three three one. Yes, um, and not quite an edge on spiral galaxy, but uh, there it is. And uh, there's a complex of them, or a cluster of galaxies. Um, there's one here, which is a little more difficult to see. And I think there's one here and one here. I think I see one on the upper right as well. Oh, up, up over here. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is also a one-minute exposure. With, That's uh, great, one minute. Wow. What <laughs> amazes me about this is that you just look at this in this tiny little field of view, and you see just a bunch of galaxies. Just, you know, and these are galaxies with, what, trillions of stars or whatever, you know? Yeah, hundreds of hundreds, hundreds of billions. Of, hundreds of billions of stars. Yeah. And each one is its own separate galaxy and you're just well, within a, in a single glance you can just see you know trillions of stars well what's really great about this one specifically is uh, it's very similar in size and structure to the Milky Way so it, they, they sometimes call it the Milky Way's twin this this specific galaxy um, so 7331 let's see yeah, yeah. I'm not Caldwell, sure. Caldwell 30 right I mean it's I'm not sure if it is a barred spiral or or just a, a regular spiral, and, and if it it looks like it does have somewhat of a bar shape, but it's not quite as as distinct. The Milky Way's would be way more distinct than this one viewed from from afar. Um, but again, I mean, it is it is a, a good sized object. It's surprising that Messier missed it. Um, of course, if he had skies like I have right now, he would have missed it. Because in the time <laughs> between when I was like looking to see how uh, how well aligned I was and all, and now we've got clouds rolling in off the Pacific. So, um, sorry, I can't really bring a view of my own. But oh, wow. um, but uh, let's see. Yeah, but uh, NGC seven three three one part of this group, and like uh, like Stuart was referring to, you can see some of these other galaxies, these other little fuzzy patches off to the the left of uh, the image that that Lewis has here. It's called a deer lick group. I'm not sure why it's a deer lick, but so uh, yeah, like my where... software Thad says it's an SB galaxy. What's that mean? So yeah. SB is as so spirals have um, you know it used to be this kind of tuning fork classification that I. I 
can't remember if Hubble came up with it or not, but the idea that um, you have ellipticals that look spherical, and that's called an E0, out to ellipticals that are fairly elongated, which is an E7, and then you have spirals that are tightly wound, which was an SA, or an SB, or an SC, and then the most loosely wound was an SD, but mm -hmm. then you also have sp barred spiral galaxies like an SBA, an SBB, SBC, SBD. So SB means it's a spiral galaxy and fairly tightly wound. Uh, yeah, let's move on. So Gary's view. Yeah, I've got another one coming just now. Um, it's the upside down Borg galaxy here, the Borg. Uh... <laughs> this this is the lagoon. Yeah. But I'll show you something interesting in it. Uh, I'm starting to lose my focus with temperature change. See the stars are look like little crescents. Right. Hmm. So I just took a second one and let me load it up. I ran a quick uh, autofocus in between. And come on, give me it. Hang on, it'll. But I think it's upside down from the view you normally give us. Oh, that's not um, crisp. Um, you know what it is? Yeah, yeah. the scope. Uh, the scope did a flip. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hate when that happens. I know. It's, it's a pain. Uh, come on, come on. Come well, on. it actually shows you're pretty orthogonal if you could do a flip and still get it. Oh, it, yeah, it tracks yeah. really nice. Let me, uh, yeah, there we go. Didn't well, even that's... stretch that guy. Yeah, it's a lot crisper. So can you yeah. flip it? Can you flip it upside down? I know, I know I'm asking for so much. You're, you're trying to embiggen yep. it. I'm asking you to flip it. There it is. Is that that yeah. more gooder? Now we see that. Yeah. Now we see the Borg Homer that we always <laughs> uh, we always see in this. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, the little wish Borg Homer. Yeah. I just got that. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> we will be assimilated. <laughs> don't don't. <laughs> It's getting awfully silly in here. Uh, yeah, really? Really? <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. If Scott was here, it would just be madness. Um, so what were some of the details that you were hoping to point out with this, Gary? That, uh, I mean, it looks like we've, we've got some of these dark globules that are showing up pretty well in contrast with, um, with this exposure. Is that some Yeah, this it? has got some really nice ridges. Uh, right there, there's some. This one... Yeah, look at yeah. those like little little trails inside. You know, and then you've got the dark areas that this has got to be star forming. Yeah, exactly. Those those knots where you see, you know, this bright background, and then this this dark. Yeah, there's there's a real good one close to center there. It just looks like this little trail coming off of it. When you see this in an emission nebula, you're looking at a region that is is forming stars, especially just just a little bit right of center in that view. It's like this little knot with this little kind of stream coming off of it. Um, you know, this is kind of classic, you know, it's, it's like the pillars of creation, um, except this is this is what's going on for the Lagoon Nebula. And, you know, somewhere deep in that, that darkest part of that is a, a star being born. So. And you can even see uh, Homer's nose hairs here. So. <laughs> are there any All donut right. crumbs on those, or...? Yeah, yeah, I think that it's hanging here in the mustache. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got, uh, Lewis has got another planetary nebula for us, and this is a classic M57 yeah. ring nebula. This, yeah, M57, the ring nebula. Um, my seeing was starting to go bad. It's not uh, very crisp, but you can still resolve the, um, the central star, uh, which presumably is the star that blew off the shell of gas that we see as a ring. Well, the, the, I think Thad is going to debunk that yeah. now for you. Yeah, right. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of this, this uh, unfortunate alignment that goes on with the, the Ring Nebula. The, the central star is actually a 15th magnitude star, so very, very faint. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's really, that's, that's not it. That's just kind of a chance alignment of another star that happens to be in about the right place to, to make people think it's the um, the central star that the, the white dwarf that that formed the ring nebula. I mean the the dumbbell nebula is a you know the the white dwarf that got that one uh, that's keeping the energy going for that one um, is 
is pretty distinct, but for the ring, it's it's actually a good bit uh, good bit fainter. So. Well, I have a dumbbell I can put up if we want to look at that. Sure, I think Nick. I think Nick Rose is going to uh, have a seizure if we don't get some of these objects up. So we've got. Uh, he's asked for uh, NGC the sixty eight twenty three. Did you try that one, uh, Lewis? Uh, no, I, I've got uh, seven thousand eight, or at least the field, but I don't see anything. I don't see anything in like there. Yeah. So, oh, that's right. So he asked for. Oh, sorry. Jose asked for seven thousand eight. Uh, yeah, I got a ton of requests actually from Nick here, so I'd love to see if we can take a crack at some of these. Uh, so we've got NGC 6823, uh, an NGC 7380, and NGC 6643, and NGC 7013. Whew. So I don't know if any of those are up. Uh, 6823 is... I'm looking at it right now. Oh, really? Okay. That, um, I'll, I'll put some of these into the chat, and you can... Yeah. You guys it can looks like a, a globular. Um, yes. I was just trying one that we hadn't done before called the Cloud Nebula, but I'm not getting anything out of it. Yeah, 7380 which is, is just a faint, open asterism almost. It's just a cluster. Um, what, do you, what else do you want, 7008? Uh, we got Cassiopeia A, 3C461... Is that like the... a, I'm not sh I'm not sure how much you would actually see with that. I mean, this is the, it's yeah. the remnants of a supernova. Um, it looks it's... way better in X-ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Uh, now this is fun. Uh, so uh, somebody asked to see the center of the Milky Way. That should be possible. Right? It's in Sagittarius. With you, you really need a DSLR and set to a pretty wide field and a good dark sky to shoot it from. I mean, with a telescope, you're really not going to get... But can't you get the star? Like, couldn't we image the supermassive black hole? We... I mean, you'd be able to image the stars that are nearby. The problem yeah. is there's so much gas and dust between us and the center of the Milky Way that the only way to penetrate all of that to be able to see anything near the supermassive black hole is using an infrared telescope. Um, so what you what you could see is the gas and dust and the more nearby stars that block our view of the center of the Milky Way. Yeah. But actually, yeah. I mean, sure, we can point. Yeah, to that's what I'm saying. So, you know, I mean, obviously, you're not going to see this amazing supermassive black hole with with stars <laughs> whirling around it, and you know, you're going to see a, a fuzzy a star a place with stars, and you have to use your imagination for the rest of it. And dense. I mean, yeah, it will be fairly dense with stars because you would be looking through the the thickest part of the Milky Way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, unless Gary or Lewis here suddenly got you know a, a telescope that's up at about you know seven or eight kilometers or higher and uh, can do infrared. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, uh, you're not going to be able to see through all that gas. I don't have yeah. my tower installed that I can climb yet. It, it's only <laughs> but this is great. I mean, I'm, I'm loving all these requests, and it's and the people who are out making the requests know their sky, so uh, it's kind of cool. We've got some great stuff. Um, oh, yeah, I'm not seeing Orion Nebula. Which is no, I know. This yeah. is great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, um, just, uh, Gary, I put the center of the Milky Way, the coordinates, into the chat. You can put it in if you want to. Um, okay, I'll do yeah. that. Let me. If, uh, if you just so you can just show the middle of it. Uh, I'm trying Monk, to do 6823 uh, right now. Okay. Monk Ellipse just asked for. Was wondering why we don't have color, um, and so because I'm clouded out. Yeah, because Stuart is clouded out. So so there's kind and of I'm two, clouded out. two yeah. kinds of cam. Yeah, and I think Thad would have brought color as well. So there's two kinds of cameras that the astronomers like to use. One is the black and white ones. And, and actually, both uh, Gary and Lewis are using roughly the same camera. You're both using this QSI uh, camera. And it's really, really sensitive and really high quality. But it's, it's designed for black and white. And so when they're doing sort of deep sky imaging, what they'll do is they'll go back and, you know, they'll, they'll take, like, one image for a long period of time in one color, and then they'll switch their filter, and they'll do another image for a long time in another color, and then they'll switch their filter, and then they'll build up this three-color view of the sky that then looks like color, while what Thad and, uh, and Stuart can do is they just have a color CCD camera that they have connected to their telescope, and it takes a, you know, a full-color image. So... The downside is that it's not as sensitive as what uh, Lewis and, and Gary can get. So sometimes, some nights, we have a whole bunch of color cameras, and some nights we have black and white ones. And, and so with these black and white ones, we just get this 
these subtle details that we just don't see with the, the color cameras. So, you know, you kind of got to appreciate them both. Well, it also has to do with uh, where you are. I'm in a very light, polluted area. So when I try to take uh, pictures with a single shot color, I just don't get much out of it at all. It's yeah. just too much sky glow. Uh, BTL743, yes, yes, we can see your comments. Yes. Um, uh, okay, so Lewis has put something new up. What is, is it? This is the Dumbbell Nebula. The Dumbbell, yes. So this is uh, Messier's 27th object. It's also the remains of a, a star a bit more massive than the sun, but not immensely more massive. And when it died, it kind of puffed out its outer layers like this. Um, yeah, just like that, too. Uh, but here you can actually see the star in the center is the white dwarf. Oh, it is? Um, yeah. For, for the dumbbell, you, you can see the, the, the central um, white dwarf star for, uh, for this one. Um, so, I mean, the thing is, I mean, white dwarfs, it's the leftover core of a star like the sun after it's died. There's no more fusion going on. It's not producing any new energy. But because the center of a star is so dense and so extremely hot that this, this leftover core of it will glow for about a billion or more years long after the, the star is gone. And so it provides enough ultraviolet light to kind of jazz up the electrons and the, the gas around it. And so we see the effect what we get is the, the dumbbell nebula. That's great. Uh, we've got one question for you, Thad, from uh, Sterling uh, Gothrop. Uh, how many arms of the Milky Way are between us and the center of the galaxy? So is this like how many licks does it take to get to the center of a... Of a galaxy? Yeah. <laughs> black hole? One billion. Any, um, so let me see. There's, there's the... Uh, let's see. We're in the Orion Spur... Um, between us and the center, so let's see, there's the there's the Centaurus arm. Um, I'm going to find an image. See. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the, the Milky Way is, is a kind of classic two-armed galaxy, but with some extra kind of spurs and extra little things kind of coming off. So it's essentially, I mean, it, sh it should just be... If I remember correctly, that it, that it is really, it's one arm, but I mean, the, the arms in the Milky Way are complex. They don't have, um, it's not just like one neat arc. It's all these little, little kind of prongs and whatever else kind of coming off of it. Okay, here you go. Um, so I've just put up an, an image of the Milky Way, an, an artist's representation of the Milky Way. Right, right. So let's see. So is there a UR here in this? Well, I um, think we are kind of right about here, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, so I mean, essentially, actually, I think we're out a little bit further than that, but still, you know, it's essentially one arm, and then you're you're kind of getting into where the central region is. So. Yeah. So we've got this arm, and then the central region. Yep. Yeah. But again, we're in a spur, so we're not ex we're not exactly in a thick arm of the the Milky Way here. If there if we were, there would be way more stars visible at night. Um, but we also wouldn't be able to see as deep deeply into space, even without interference from, um, uh, we, well, sorry, with the interference from the gas and dust in the Milky Way, that about the farthest you can see from our position in the galaxy is about three to 4,000 light years out. Um, if we were in a denser part where there's there was way more gas and dust inside one of the those tightly wound, uh, in, inside one of those those denser parts of the arms, you know, maybe we'd only be able to see about 1,000 light years out or so. Or so. So wow. where we are, we get a little bit better view because we're not in the, the real thick of one of those arms. Awesome. All right, so we've got, we got a bunch more objects here, so let's, uh, let's keep rolling. So, uh, Gary. This is the requested 6823. Um, now, I had to bin that. That's a one minute, and it's binned at 4 by 4 so I can't enlarge it. Uh, it's pretty dim here. This um, this is something I would take long exposures of as I was gonna. But I, it's got a great, uh, really great kind of dark dust lane there. Yeah, it's one that I'm gonna have to go back and look at. I made a note by it. I've i I'm now I've decided this is the Loch Ness Nebula. <laughs> it's Nessie. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean, you have a an, again kind of classic arrangement. We have a star cluster. Um, at the, the center of this, you have the emission nebula, the less leftover hydrogen, um, you know, some of which went into forming those stars in the cluster. You've got this dark nebula 
impinging here. Again, new star formation going on where you have the dark nebula. And then you even have a, this bit of embedding around it. I mean, if you're looking kind of above, like around the nebula itself, above and below it to the left, you can see it's kind of embedded in a, in a dark nebula. So here, I mean, I'm this, gonna, this... I'm gonna screen share uh, an image that came from astronomy picture of the day. And so you can see that, that crazy dark dust lane there. Yes, and I had not imaged this one, so well, this I'm, is great. Have to go well, back at it. That was I love wonderful. It. So I think that was a great suggestion. Uh, was it? Uh, which, which one was, is this again? This was sixty-eight twenty-three. And who asked for sixty-eight twenty-three? You can suggest stuff for us anytime. Jose asked for it. So thanks. That was great. So, you know your sky. Yeah, a new so object that we've never seen before. This where is, in the sky oh, is this? This I'm not. Yeah, I'm not familiar with this myself. Uh, let me look it up here. It is not. It's off, a Volpecula. We, we get a brand okay. new object. Yeah. yeah so Volpecula so, is also where yeah. the dumbbell is. So if we go back to to Lewis's previous view there, um, that object and this object are kind of neighbors. Neat. Yeah, yeah it's it, in it's in Cygnus. Yeah, it's not too far from Alberio. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ronald uh, Minch gives us a mini update on Comet Ison that it's growing in magnitude slower than expected and may not reach magnitude 10 until September. I don't know if you've been tracking Ison, Thad. Um, a little bit. I mean, I saw the picture that Scott uh, yeah, posted. Yeah, the Hubble one. The Hubble one with the galaxies in the background. Yeah, so, that looks pretty great. Yeah, growing slow. I mean, you, you know, comets, they just be so kind of random with, uh, with, with you know, what the conditions are for each particular comet. So, um, you know, growing slower, I think to me that would seem a little bit more encouraging. It's if they, you know, start to evaporate quickly when they're far out, that uh, that can cause a bit of a problem. So maybe if it's, you know, maybe if it's brightening a little slower, maybe it is a little more compact and has a better chance of making, you know, surviving this trip around the sun. And giving us the show that we all like have every set of fingers and toes and you know whatever else crossed in hopes that uh, we get that that view that weekend after Thanksgiving, would uh, which is you know that that's that's the weekend right the the yeah. you know American so sorry Fraser yeah American Thanksgiving right that Saturday and Sunday there the, after that that'll be the days for the view for Comet Ison. So. Yeah, and it's I feel, feel so bad because people are like, what's it going to do? And we, you know, our answer is we have no idea, and we won't know until it happens or doesn't happen. Yeah, like it's got to come from the backside of that sun, and the moment it does, we'll know whether we're in for a big show or whether it's fizzled out. So, and there's no way to know until after that happens. Um, so stay tuned. So stay tuned. So, uh, Lewis, you got M13. Yeah, I've got M13 uh, up now, a globular cluster, and I can try to embiggen it. Whoops. There we go. This is also one minute um, exposure I managed to get off um, a little while ago. Yeah, so I think you know, again, I mean, we were talking about the difference between the color and the black and white cameras. I mean, this is a this is a what a one minute exposure, and Thad, you were taking. Minutes and minutes and minutes when you add up all those exposures that you're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, each individual shot was only 20 seconds, though. Yeah. So, you know, the main thing there with the av the averaging does is it gets rid of kind of noise. It gets rid of, um, you know, it, it does help build up a signal. Yes, but um, yeah. It's... You know, it's really it's kind of the square root of the number of exposures that you have as as to how much taking multiple exposures helps to reduce noise. Does it make more sense to take a bunch of short exposures or to do one long exposure? It depends on the object. Um, the, the thing is with with 16-bit cameras that uh, exist nowadays where you have about 65,000 different light levels possible, you can take short exposures and get about as much detail as you would with like an 8-bit camera. Um, the thing is, though, if you want something that's really rich in, in different light levels, um, you know, galaxies do much better with, with longer exposures. Getting the faint outer tendrils of a nebula, you really need that kind of long exposure and then do processing so that the, um, first of all, clobber out the background, kind of bring up the light levels of the, the outer tendril part subtly, you know, kind of flatten out the bright central area. There's there's processing to make these images look the way that, that we see them. But the 
the general rule is the more light that you capture, the, the longer an exposure that you can have for a faint object, the more light, the more levels you have to play with. You also run into the opposite problem, though, with something very bright like M13, is if you go with too long of an exposure, now you've overexposed it, and you've filled up all of these buckets with as much light as possible, and now you don't have any room to play with anything because you, you just bleached everything out. So it's, you know, kind of knowing your object, knowing your optics, you know, knowing your camera, and then kind of setting exposures for the, the, the right kind of, uh, of range so you still have room to play. That's the main thing. Anytime you're taking photos, you want to leave yourself room to play. It definitely is an art. Um, okay, I'm going to move to Gary's view. This is the coordinates from uh, Stuart for the center of our galaxy. Right on. So there's some nebulosity. This area's got all kinds of stuff going on, but somewhere right around in here is the center of our galaxy that's hidden by all that nasty dark dust. Yep, so this is kind of, it's on the border between um, Scorpius and Sagittarius. If you, if you look at Sagittarius as a teapot, there's the triangle that makes the spout, and you follow the top two stars in the, the teapot and kind of slide over a little bit to the the west from there, um, that's right about where the center of the galaxy is. Now, um, Messier 7 and 6, which are some huge star clusters in, in Scorpius, are just kind of just south of the, the center of the galaxy. Um, and again, I mean, you know, you're looking in the, the thick of the galaxy, so you're going to find emission nebulae, you're going to find star clusters, but you're also going to find a lot of dust that unless you have access to the Keck telescope or some of these telescopes in Chile, you're never going to penetrate that dust with visible light, and it will block the view of where that supermassive black hole is. Right, but right now, all of us are staring right at a black hole with a, what, 100 million times the mass of the sun? About 4 million. Yeah. Oh, four million, right. Yeah. Sorry. For our galaxy, it's only about four million. And it was Andrea Ghez at UCLA who had done the, the studies of tracking the motions of the stars near the center of the galaxy. Again, using infrared telescopes, using adaptive optics, really kind of pushing the limit of what our, our uh, capabilities are at this time, and uh, has been able to map this out. So if you look for, like, galactic center group at UCLA, then... Um, then you can see her work. You can even see some of these GIFs, some of these animations that she's created tracking there's a the motion. Uh, there's a terrific Nova episode. Where she they just cover, has done some great work. Yeah, where they cover her research and they show this wonderful animation of these stars whipping around the the supermassive black hole. And you can really see like the, the amount of gravity that's got to be there for them to make this journey. It's just astonishing. Yeah, I mean, real hairpin turns, and these stars—they're you know—they're more than the mass of the sun. So something that can just whip it around like that, like you know, like this game of crack the whip. You know, yeah. That's, that's got to be you know quite quite massive. And if you if you use essentially you know modified versions of Kepler's law, if you use you know, Newton's extension of of Kepler's law, there you can figure out. Well, the thing that they're whipping around has got to be about four million times the mass of the sun. If you take my physics 100 course, you have to do that as a problem, is figure out what the the mass is of the the supermassive black hole using some orbital data. So. <clears throat> I've got an actual image here. I'm going to try and share it. Okay, let me see if I can share this image. There we go. So, yeah, so, I mean, this is, if you look at the scale, right, at the top of that, that image that you're sharing, it shows 0.2 arc seconds. Right, so an arc minute is 1 60th of a degree, and I imagine the Gary's field of view here is probably about it's about what two degrees across, maybe. Uh, one and a half by one. Okay, all right. So so one and a half. All right. So I was overestimating a little bit. Okay, so if you took his image top to bottom, and you cut it into sixty equal pieces, each slice would be one arc minute. All right. Then if you took one of those slices and chopped that up into um, 60 pieces, that would be arc seconds. So the field of view that we're looking at from this picture from the Galactic Center group right, is about 3,000 times smaller than the size of Gary's image here from top to bottom. So just zoom in, Gary. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just zoom in. Zoom Don't in. Don't do any binning. Just enhance, zoom. enhance and magnify. Zoom into my square stars. Yeah, so we'll go back <laughs> to Gary's view here. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a great. I I, I it was I think it's called like Galactic Monster or Monster at the 
center of the Milky Way or something like that. Anyway, look it up. Nova episode on on the uh, supermassive black hole. Um, oh, cool. Okay, so Lewis, you've got a treat for us. Um, I'm gonna go to your view of. Uh, oh, we lost it. Okay, that was M3. Whatever. We oh. seen the globular cluster. No, no. We move on to your next thing. Okay. Because um, this is cool. There we go, Neptune. All right. Nice. So we had uh, we had Pluto, and now we have Neptune. Good night. This is great. The two of you just tag teaming. It's too bad it's not color because it would be purple or blue. It, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Deep blue green color. And yeah. I'm wondering if we're seeing Triton Oop. off to the one side. I mean, not not below it and to the the right. That's way too bright for Triton. Oh, the, right, right there. That little dot that's just at about 10 o'clock relative to Neptune. So yeah, I wonder if we've got um, Neptune's largest moon there too. You know, I might have software that can tell me that. Uh, <laughs> someone's, I think someone's using Stellarium, too, so maybe they can tell us whether that's Triton as well. But so, uh, Uranus is still not quite up, right? Yeah, Uranus is kind of on the border between... It's, it's, it's in Pisces right now. So, um, but yeah. Neptune is in um, Capern It's in um, Caprica. No, um, Capricorn. Caprica. <laughs> Caprica. <laughs> so say we all. So say um, we all. But uh, yeah, ne Neptune is in uh, in Capricorn. I guess it's you know slowly eking its way over toward Aquarius. So it for for Lewis, yeah, it would be uh, pretty well placed right about yeah. now. So uh, sadly, we're not seeing Triton. Triton would be right here. It, it may actually be stuck in the. Um, in the glow of Neptune. Oh, okay. this, this, yeah. this was pretty low in the sky and kind of muddy, so it's kind of it's bloated. It may have bloated over uh, where Triton is. Okay. And again, you're you're working with a fairly large field of view, so it's it's fairly likely that um, yeah, that you you it would be kind of blown out. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to move to Gary's view. Thanks, ne thanks, uh, Lewis, for Neptune. That was awesome. Great. Yeah. Pluto, sure. Neptune, dear. Uh, what happens with, when you take a picture of Saturn? Is it just too bright? It is pretty bright. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've really imaged Saturn with this scope. I mean, I don't think I have. Oh, you know what? I, that, that, there's nothing I like to hear more than that. <laughs> yeah, with this scope and camera combination, I imagine Saturn would look like an oval blob. Yeah. But yeah. you'd probably be able to get... Uh, a fair number of the moons around it. I mean, oh, Titan yeah. shows up very easily, but I, kn I know that I've, um, you know, there was one night I, I was shooting Saturn with the, the CCD camera that I typically use for deep sky stuff because I wanted to see how many moons I'd be able to, to pull out. I mean, Saturn is just blah, overexposed oval in the middle. Um, but yeah, I think I was able to pull out like five or maybe six moons from, um, from imaging it that way. That's pretty great, yeah. I'll have to try that. It's not really a planetary scope, but um, yeah, I should be able to resolve the moon instead. I mean, this, I don't want you to break your telescope. Yeah, uh, it'll you. be fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, did, were you going to try tonight, or are you going to try another night? A set uh, set for, for Lewis. Is it set point. for him already? Oh, yeah. 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 All right. Um, yeah. Let us know the let us know the result of the experiment. Well, I think we have time for one last image. So I'm going to show Gary's last image here. Uh, I don't know. Did you have something else queued up, Lewis? Uh, I can put M3 back up, but... Um, yeah, well, we didn't get a chance to talk about that, so we'll take a look at that for a second. First, Gary, I see the propeller. That's it. Either that or see cheesy Italian mustache. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mario! Or Luigi. Yeah. <laughs> so. And we've decided that it's complete fluke that the uh, nebula's in this shape. Yeah, I mean, it depends on where we are relative to it. You know, it depends on how it's evolved from the stars that have formed from it, how that's kind of pushed some of the, the hydrogen gas and dust away. So, yeah, again, any actually any nebula, any arrangement that we see is a fluke. Right? It really just <laughs> happens to be whatever the, the way yeah. things have, have uh, shaped it to look that from, uh, from that particular region of gas and dust and our perspective of where we are relative to it in the in the galaxy here. Well, we had that conversation about the ring nebula a couple of weeks ago that, that the thought is that it's not just a ring, but it's actually like a cylinder that we're looking down the, the tube of it. So, yeah, that, it's, that it is a little bit more, it's kind of more egg-shaped, right? And we happen to be um, looking along, not looking at the egg this way, but looking at it more... Down the... Like this. Yeah. Yeah. So and we're seeing the... We're seeing an, not the, the egg on the side. Looking down at the point of the egg. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 
And if you want to go balance an egg even today, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You don't need to wait for the uh, don't need to wait for the equinox. Uh, all right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna close up on uh, on Lewis's beautiful view of M3. So just another globular cluster. I know we had a couple of requests for that. Sorry we didn't get all those other objects, uh, but I do appreciate the the request. That was awesome to get uh, to get such knowledgeable requests and a, and a brand new object that we haven't seen before. I'm, I was that was wonderful. I'm really excited. I, I love when someone goes, hey, you guys should check this out, and then we do, and it looks great, and we've never seen it before. That's my favorite thing ever. Yeah, I just tried 7008, and I can't. It just looks like a star. It does? Okay, yeah. 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 But, uh, uh, and, and, and Lewis said the exact same thing. He tried mm-hmm. 708 and just, you know, nothing that was, he could tell, you know, that wasn't a star, so... Cool. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for for joining us tonight and uh, watching the night sky. We actually made it through quite a lot of objects. That was that was really great. Uh, and thank you very much for Gary and Lewis and and having your clear skies. That's uh, that's perfect. Uh, and thanks, Stuart, for uh, for bringing the color commentary. And Thad, I'm sorry you didn't get your your telescope streaming tonight, but I suspect we'll probably have you next week. But now you have a backyard. Right. Yes. Yes. So now we now I can actually just set the thing up and and kind of just put it under a tarp and leave it out here and come out the next night and be ready to go in in about 15 minutes as opposed to you know 40 minutes is typical setup. So right out in the out in the front yard in the street right with people coming people and checking. And, hey, yeah. And it's like okay, well I'm trying to do outreach and if I can do it in person or I can do it online, I can't really do both at the same time. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, don't don't lose your your interest in sidewalk astronomy. So you know, go out into the front yard every now and then. So nicely enough, my uh, my father-in-law's father had bought a Quest Star back in the '60s. I am now custodian of it. I don't. It's not mine, but he's letting me keep it, and I've been using it for some some outreach. That is a beautiful instrument. If you ever get a chance to look through a yeah. Quest Star, take it. So. Um, so uh, Ronald Minch notes that Sky and Telescope has a good article by Alan French on eyepieces, and uh, the latest Sky and, Tel- Sky, uh, and Telescope has an article about the virtual star party in it, which is kind of cool, written yes, by our, our good friend David Dickinson. So, uh, yep. yeah, if you can get your hands on the new uh, on the new Sky and Telescope, you can read all about the virtual star party. But you probably already know everything about it already. <laughs> so, Cool. Okay, so tomorrow uh, we may or may not be doing a astronomy cast. I'm not sure where on Earth Pamela is, so... Uh, if that's going to happen or not, but if not, we will definitely be doing the uh, the weekly space hangout on Friday. Uh, I'll have two more explainer videos coming up this week, um, talking about panspermia, I think, and uh, a stellar engine moving stars around the galaxy. So, um, so you can check those out on uh, on my YouTube channel. Just go to the Universe Today YouTube channel on YouTube, uh, which you're watching right now. So, uh, okay, great. Well. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for watching us. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.